Um, now, I'd just like to read uh, Galatians 1, 1 to 9. Uh, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Uh, Over the course of my messages... I've been bringing a series on living in the shadow of the cross. And I started with, firstly, the sacrilege of the cross, and then the suffering of the cross, uh, and then the sacrifice of the cross. And today I want to talk to you about the security of the cross. So uh, before I bring the word, let's just ask God uh, to speak to our hearts. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for his willingness to endure all the things that we've been learning about. And we know that, Father, as the king, he was in control, but we know that he still had to suffer those things. He still had to endure the contradiction of sinners against himself. But we thank you that he, that he did that because he had the joy of knowing that he would be able to win salvation for us. And so we thank you for him and for the blessing we've had to remember all those wonderful uh, events. And Lord, as we now focus again on the cross of Christ, I pray that you might speak to our hearts, to reassure us of things we know to be true, and perhaps there's some here today who just need this message for them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the accusations uh, people often make about fundamentalists is that we are legalists. (coughs) You may have... You may have uh, been called a legalist by somebody. Uh, If you have uh, been a fundamentalist pastor for any time, somebody's bound to have called you a legalist. And I would have to say that some of those that we are associated with do make it hard to refute the claim. But as you know, what our slanderers are often observing is not legalism, but what we might term Pharisaism. It's not biblical legalism, but Pharisaism. Uh, So, friends, it's something that we need to be careful of because the Pharisees were the fundamentalists of Jesus' day. I know Jesus combated with them, but they were the people who held to to the the literal uh, interpretation of the Bible. But true biblical legalism is different from Pharisaism. And true biblical legalism is a form of apostasy. Legalism is any doctrine which adds works to faith in order for a soul to be saved. If somebody says you have to believe in Christ but also do this, that's legalism and that's apostasy. Um, One example that we've seen, and we see many times, is requiring faith plus baptism in order to be saved. Baptismal regeneration was perhaps the oldest era in Christendom. You don't have to read too far into the church fathers and it really, it really hits you hard when you see that they believed this. This is properly legalism, which if embraced, will result in a person not being saved. If you think you need to be, believe in Christ and be baptised to be saved, if that's what you believe, you are not saved, according to God's word. It was legalism that provoked Paul to write to the Galatian churches. Judaistic teachers had visited their churches and spread this error. They taught that in order for a person to be saved, they must have faith in Christ and be circumcised and keep certain elements of the law of Moses. A faith in Christ was not enough. It's faith plus circumcision plus certain elements of the law of Moses. 
And Paul was alarmed by the, the, the impact that this teaching was having on these Galatian churches. Have a look in chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Paul was alarmed at what was happening. He told them that they were in fact, uh, he told them, sorry, the danger of falling into legalism in uh, different places, but chapter 5, have a look. He, though, he, he believed they were foolish for believing uh, this uh, Judaistic uh, error, uh, but there was a great danger in embracing it. Uh, chapter 5, verse 3, he says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. It's a very serious matter to fall into this particular uh, error. You just might miss out on the grace of God. You just might miss out on heaven if you believe this error. Now in chapter 2 of this epistle, Paul related an example of how even the Apostle Peter was affected by legalism. Uh, Now this occurred uh, during a visit Peter made to the church in Antioch in Syria. And Paul had to stand up to the great apostle And he had to rebuke him. Now, think about who Peter is. I mean, he had spent those three years with the Lord. He was the, he was the, like the top apostle. And he was a part of the Jerusalem church that had sent Barnabas to Antioch to establish the church in Antioch. Peter was really, uh, he was, uh, he wasn't the Pope, (laughs) but he was, he was a very important person in Christendom. And yet the apostle Paul had to stand up to him and rebuke him because of his association with this error. Have a look in chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. He said, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now, I would hate to be someone who Paul was rebuking. That That would not be easy. But here is the Apostle Paul you know, facing off the Apostle Peter. And Paul says, I had to do that because he was to be blamed. Peter was in error. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. He was happy to eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, the people from James, from Jerusalem, he withdrew and separated himself fearing them which were of the circumcision. The Jewish Christians, the the Christians of uh, of Jerusalem, they had not yet worked out entirely uh, that, that this was not just a Jewish faith. And, and, and their Jewishness uh, would, was preventing them from having fellowship with their Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ. And Peter was caught up in this. And not just Peter. Verse 13, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with, much, with, sorry, with their dissimulation. Barnabas was basically the man that God had used to start the church in Antioch. He was the one who had reached out to these Gentile believers. And yet here he was uh, carried away with this dissimulation, caught up in uh, this particular uh, form of error. Now after recounting this confrontation with Peter, Paul went on to give his doctrinal reasons for this stern measure of rebuking Peter in verse 16. He says, and here's his doctrinal basis for standing up and taking on the first apostle. He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now in this doctrinal basis for the reason he had to take on Peter, 
Paul tells us of the two methods for being saved, if you like, just to sort of water it down. They're both methods of being saved are found in this verse. You can be, try to be saved by the works of the law or you can be, try to be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. These are two methods. And they are mutually exclusive. You can't believe in Christ and keep the works of the law to be saved. It's either the works of the law or it's faith in Christ. You can't have both. Justification either comes through the law, which is a work salvation, and it's based on merit, our merit, or justification is through Jesus Christ. A faith salvation based on God's grace. God will give grace to those who believe in Christ. That's justification by faith. Now, if we mix works with faith, Paul goes on to tell us we just, we'll just end up back where we were. In verse 18, he says, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Where do we start this whole process of being saved? We start as sinners. If we mix faith with works, we just end up being sinners. If we think that we can add any work to faith to gain salvation, God will not save us. We are fallen from grace. This is Martin Luther's, Luther's sola fide, faith alone. This was the great truth that he discovered in his, his desire to be right with God. Faith plus baptism Faith plus circumcision, faith plus the laying out of hands, faith plus any work or ritual whereby we think we can earn our salvation is legalism. And it frustrates God's work of grace. Paul goes on to conclude that in verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Think of that. If I can be justified just on my own merit by keeping the law, then why did Christ have to die on the cross? Grace and faith go hand in hand in God's salvation plan. For by grace are you saved through faith, Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, that's Romans chapter 4. If we want to receive God's saving grace, then it must be by faith alone. There's no other way. Now, the funny thing about we humans, we always want to do something. If we're going to receive some benefit, we always feel like we should do something to earn it. But the fact is, all has been done for us. In Hebrews 9.26 it says, that now once in the end of the world hath appeared, I'll say it again, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. There's nothing left for us to do. Christ has done it all. He has paid the the penalty for all our sin, all of the sin of all of us, or of all mankind. Just once was Christ offered to bear the sins of many. Now, in Galatians 2, Paul goes on to give a one-verse summary then of, of a Christian's relationship to the law. And it's really, I think that's what verse 19 is. Galatians 2.19. He says, For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Paul said that he was dead to the law. Now, by this he meant that the law could no longer condemn him for his sins. Our gracious God had justified Paul by his faith in Christ. God had seen Paul's faith in Christ, and on the basis of that, God had made him righteous. And God had freed him then from the condemnation of the law. I don't know if you know anything about church history, but uh, the Roman Catholic courts uh, 
have a unique uh, quality. The Roman Catholic courts of the, the Middle Ages were the only courts that I know where they, they dug up dead bodies and they put those dead people on trial. Did you know that they did that? They did that for John Wycliffe. They did that for John Huss. Uh, they, they dug up their bodies, exhumed their bodies, and they, they brought them before a court to bring judgment upon them. And they're the only courts that I know of in history that have taken dead people to court. The fact is, friends, that the law has no power over people who are dead. They might have power over their property or power over their family, but once a person's dead, they're dead to the law. Well, Paul declared this was the same for him. When he was justified, when he was saved, he died to the law. He said, for through the law, I am dead to the law. The law had done its job on Paul. The, 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 the mission of the law in Paul's life was to be the schoolmaster that brought him to the Christ. The law was the means whereby God condemned, showed Paul he was a condemned sinner and he raced to Christ for grace, for salvation. The schoolmaster, the law was the schoolmaster that led him to Christ and thanks to Christ he said he'd been free now from that law. Now this, this is the context when Paul then wrote this amazing verse, which is really the text. Not, not that there's, in, there's much more message to go, but uh, you see, it's in this context of... Um, where he says simply, for through the law I am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am now dead to the law. Then he, then, he, then, he, then he writes this incredible verse. He then goes on to say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul declared, I am crucified with Christ. And by doing that, in this context, he is telling us when he died to the law. He said, I'm dead to the law. The law can't get anything on me anymore. And when did that happen? He said, I am crucified with Christ. Now, the Greek word here for crucified, it's a verb. I am crucified is in my favorite tense, <laughs> Greek tense. It's in the perfect tense. It's a past completed action. I have been crucified, past completed action. And this has resulted in a continual state of being dead to the law. And that's why our translators have gone for that continual state. Because I died in the past, past completed action, now I'm dead. I am dead. I am crucified with Christ. You know, this is how it is for my dear grandma. She died. On the 13th of January, 2003, I had the privilege of preaching at her funeral. She died on that day, past completed action, and consequently she's still dead as far as I understand. Because she died on that day, now she is dead. Is that correct? Is that how it's true for all those folks that you know who've died? And you know, there's no possibility of her not being dead, except, of course, the resurrection. Thankfully, she was saved. But Paul declared that thanks to the grace of God, he was dead to the law. And you know, this applies to all who are saved. If you have trusted Christ as Saviour and you have been justified by him, by him, you are dead to the law. Living in the shadow of the cross means that we can have the same assurance that Paul had. Living in the cross means that we can have this same assurance that Paul had. If we have placed our faith in Christ and Christ alone, we are also dead to the law. Now you might say, well, why is that important? Well, any pastor will tell you that they often come across Christians who lack the assurance of their salvation. They don't have that sense of security that they are actually saved. Now, when somebody comes along who shares that lack of assurance, it could be because they're not saved. And so we must share the gospel with them and, uh, to make sure they know the truth. There are a lot of folks that come to our church, they're from different church backgrounds, and they've never heard the gospel. It's amazing how many people come and they, they come to church, they bring their Bibles, they sing their hymns, but they've never heard the gospel message. 
And so if somebody comes and says, I'm not sure I'm safe, Pastor, just go and share the gospel with them. Make sure they know the truth. But you know, there are those who struggle with this assurance who are among the most faithful members of our church. I've had various members in my church over time who after a message on on sin or a message on judgment, they begin to panic and they come to the door and they shake your hand, think of that message, Pastor, but I'm not sure I'm saved. And they've been coming to my church for, for years. We know that there are people that are in our churches that seem to be faithful members of our churches who still lack the assurance of their salvation. So what you do is, if, if, you, if, you, if they need it, you, you take them through the, the salvation steps again. But if, but if they, it seems they have already trusted Christ and they're still not sure, it, it seems that they are still fearing the condemnation of the law, aren't they? If, they still not, if they're still not sure they're saved, what they're lacking is this assurance that the law has no hold on them. And this is why we all need to look to the cross of Christ because it was there the Lord Jesus Christ won our freedom from the law. Some people say, I'm not sure I've had enough faith or I'm not sure that my faith is strong enough or something and I tell them it's not about believing in your own believing. It's believing in him. Is he strong enough to save you. That's all you've got to be sure of. You know, we usually quote Galatians 2.20 as a justification. Sorry, we don't usually quote uh, Galatians 2.20 as a justification verse. We don't usually think of our co-crucifixion with Christ as as having reference to our justification. But in fact, this is where we can find our assurance of salvation. This is the context in which it was shared. This is the context in which Paul wrote it. And it is a good verse for us to remember. We're not not sure or we lack security of our salvation. Paul tells us in Galatians 2.20 that when Christ died, I died with him. I am crucified with Christ. When a person trusts in Christ, God's spirit does spiritual surgery. We don't feel it. We might not even know it at the time, but he does it. This is the baptism by the spirit. God's spirit places us onto that cross with Christ. Have a look in Colossians chapter 2. I'll show you. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 11 and 12. In verse 10 he says, and ye are complete in him. That's it. When you're in Christ, this is true of you. And ye are complete in him, in Christ. Verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. This is spiritual baptism, not water baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. This is the baptism by the Spirit. God's Spirit places us, if you like, on that cross uh, the day Jesus died. I am crucified. I have been past completed action crucified with Christ. With Christ. So that when Christ bled and died to satisfy the demands of the law, we died with him. When he died to the righteous demands of the law, we died to the righteous demands of the law. Now it's a mystery and we don't feel it. But it's as real as heaven itself. It's what happened when you were saved. And as the result of this co-crucifixion with Christ, have a look in verse 13 and 14. Paul goes on to say, and you being dead in your sins and and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, hath he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the whale, nailing it to his cross. The moment we are saved, all the offences recorded against us 
are blotted out. Because we are crucified with Christ, we become dead to the law, then all of the offences against us are blotted out. Now that Greek word, the Greek word for blotted out, is the word to expiate, to wipe away. This word was used by Thucydides of whitewashing a wall. All of those those sins, those offences, those terrible things that you have done and do do and will do have all been blotted out. The moment that you were crucified with Christ. And it means that we are free from the condemnation of the law. All that has been written in heaven or in our conscience that condemns us for our sins has been expunged. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. The chorus says it, doesn't it? It's a terrific little chorus. God has blotted them out. I'm happy and glad and what? Free. That's how it goes. God has blotted them out. I'm happy and glad and free. Free from what? Free from the law. Free from the condemnation of the law. I can no longer be condemned by the law because I am crucified with Christ. Martin Luther, the German monk, was, was depressed by his many sins. He thought God was a tyrant and the more he tried to please God, the, less he, the more he seemed to hate God because he could never, never meet the, 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 the demands of a holy God. Luther was all too aware that he could never, ever meet God's standard. He entered a monastery. He tried to appease his guilt with all kinds of works and self-harm, but nothing he tried brought the relief that he desired. One day, the superintendent of the Augustinian monasteries visited him. He was a man called John Stalpitz. And he, he under, this, this was a monk. Most monks were just out there. They were just trying to keep off the streets and have a feed every night and they had no real sense of God. But this monk, he really had a desire and a thirst after God, but he could find no peace. Now this John Stoutpitz, he had, a, he had in, some inklings of the grace of God already. And so he went to Martin Luther and he said these words to him and these were life-changing words. He said, Martin, look to the wounds of Christ for there you will find a full and sufficient pardon. Look to the wounds of Christ, not to yourself, not to your own efforts, not even to your own ability to believe or not believe. Look to him, his wounds, because in his wounds on the cross you will find a full and sufficient pardon. And you know he was right. Because our assurance of salvation isn't found in our ability to work or our ability to believe, but in Christ's ability to save. So we need to answer the thoughts that falsely condemn us. When we get shaken, our security gets shaken, when our assurance gets shaken, we need to answer those sort of thoughts just like Paul did. We need to, to shout it aloud at our false guilt. Uh, we need to shout it at men and Devils are alike, alike, but we need to shout it at our own souls, mostly. And what do we need to shout out? Well, simply, it's the answer to all the condemnation of the law. I am crucified with Christ. When he died to the law, I died with him. And I'm in a continual state of death to the law. You see, that day, the righteous demands of the law are all my sins past, present and future, were satisfied by his blood. P.P. Bliss, he knew of this truth, didn't he? He said, free from the law, O oh, happy condition. Jesus has bled and there is remission. Cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace hath redeemed us once for all. Once for all, O oh, sinner, receive it. Once for all, O oh, brother, believe it. Cling to the cross. We're looking at the security of the cross, cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. Paul told the Romans in chapter 7, verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye have become dead to the law 
by the body of Christ. That body that hung, that day on the cross, you've become dead to the law because of the body of the cross. And you know, when you believed in Christ, you were crucified with him. We must rest in our freedom from the law that our Lord Jesus has won for us on the cross. And when our assurance is rattled, we must remember we have been crucified with him. This is the security of the cross, and it's found in our co-crucifixion. But I have a note of warning because I knew there would be some pastors here. Are you sure you're sad? No. You know, we can take people to the cross. We know how to do that. And we can tell them that it's faith alone in Christ that wins God's grace. But then we can make it seem if they don't p- perform this or that work, then they may not just be saved. Isn't that what we can do? I mean, they must be baptised, but only by the authorised churches. Uh, They must stop drinking and smoking. They must read only one type of Bible verse and they must attend three church services every week. And a woman, she must only wear dresses and a man, he must have a a short haircut. And if they don't fulfil these works that they learn about, then perhaps you're not saved. We fulfil the security of the cross. Sorry, we preach the security of the cross. Then we erode it with our Pharisaism. And that happens, it happens. This is an error that fundamentalist churches are prone to fall into. It's a, it's, it's a hard thing to do, to get it right. I know, I'm a pastor, been one for a few years. My dad's a pastor. My pastor's a pastor. I know how easy it is to fall into this error. They might not outright say it. They might not outright state their doubts of some people, but this is the message that comes across. Now let me say, all these works might be good for a Christian. But they must not become a law that we need to keep in order to prove that we're saved. All that is. When that happens, we end back up here in Galatians chapter 2 verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. This may not be legalism that we are uh, enforcing upon our people, but you know, it might not be legalism, but it sure feels like it if you're the victim of it. It feels like legalism. It feels like you're not good enough and maybe you're not even saved. And you just start feeling like a sinner and you lose your sense of security, the security of the cross. And so the people we lead to God's grace can lack security because we take them back to the law. If we lead a soul to faith in the finished work of Christ, then add some law-keeping to perform, then all we'll do is we'll make them transgressors because there's not a man alive who can keep all of the works of any law. And so, gentlemen, we must never confuse justification with sanctification. Our justification is a once-off act, past completed action. I am crucified by Christ and we are justified and kept glory. That's the security of the cross. But our sanctification, well, that's ongoing, isn't it? You know, our sanctification may result in a a good haircut, the right haircut. Uh, Our our sanctification might uh, lead us to have a new wardrobe. But these are not works of the law, they are works of grace. The, The Uh, Grace, our sanctification might draw us to church to every Sunday. Our our sanctification might have us leave old habits behind. But these are all the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and we must make sure that our people understand. This has nothing to do with their justification, but it is their sanctification. When we confuse the two, we can rob a saint of the security of the cross. So preachers and pastors, let's beware we don't fall into this error. But having said that, on the other hand, many non-fundamentalist churches rest in the security of the cross and they forget the sanctification of the cross, don't they? Which is the rest of the message of Galatians 2. You see, the first part of Galatians tells us when Paul 
was released from the condemnation of law and crucified with Christ. But that now made it possible. Now I'm justified for God to have his sanctifying work in me. You see, he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm alive. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we are justified in order that we might be able to be sanctified, to live a new life, a better life. That's the second part of Galatians 2.20, what I call the sanctification of the cross, and that's what I'll talk about this evening. But perhaps there's somebody here today and you're the person I'm talking about. You know. You know Christ is the Son of God. You know that he died for your sins and rose from the dead, but you still have those feelings that are not truly saved. The best place for you to look is to the wounds of Christ. And you'll find in them that he's paid all that needs to be paid for your sins. You, you, you declare to those feelings, I am crucified with Christ. This is the security of the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you've done for sinners like us, sinners lost and undone. We, we have, there's nothing in us that, Lord, that, that could merit what Jesus did for us that day upon the cross of Calvary in winning our salvation. We thank you, Lord, we don't understand it, but we thank you that we have been placed with him that day when he died. When he died, I died. And when he rose, I rose from the dead. And I pray that, Father, if there's somebody here today who lacks that security, I pray that, Lord, they will be able to rest in the, the, wor the work, the salvation that Christ has won for them. We thank you for our time in the Word. In Jesus' name, amen.